Excellent. Welcome, everyone, to our uh, next panel session on the Grand Bargain. It's uh, nice to see so many faces in person as opposed to virtual meetings as we usually carry out. Uh, I recognize many of you from our conversations on humanitarian finance, Grand Bargain, and other topics. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Jeremy Rempel, Head of Humanitarian Finance for ICFA. Uh, so the topic for today's sessions are obviously very close to my area of interest. Uh, and of course, it, it would not be a good discussion on humanitarian finance without touching on the Grand Bargain, which I think is on uh, everyone's minds, certainly uh, this year. As we start, just a, a couple of housekeeping items. We are translating. We are recording the session uh, with translation so that it's easy for our colleagues who can't be here to access. So as we do that, uh, we just have to remember to stay relaxed, uh, speak clearly when we have, uh, when we have the, uh, the mic shared on the floor. Good to uh, take your time, make sure that uh, we, can, we can make it clear for the translators who are uh, working hard to make sure everyone can participate in the conversation. So just a reminder there. So the grand bargain, I think, uh, I think as most of us are aware, 2023 is something of a, a crossroads year in the Grand Bargain, especially um, for those of us who have been working on the facilitation group, uh, quite of intense negotiation on what do we do next with the Grand Bargain, what happens next. Uh, we're at a point in time, seven years now into the process, uh, where we have to make some decisions on the future of the Grand Bargain. Uh, we're, we're just getting ready to conclude what we call Grand Bargain 2.0, so a, a second uh, emphasis of the Grand Bargain that was designed to help focus us even further on some core commitments, some top enabling priorities of localization, uh, quality funding, uh, which are uh, topics that I think we're all well aware of in the discussions we've had so far. So it is, it is an important year. And I know any time we have a conversation on the Grand Bargain, one of the challenges is that we have a, a big range of understanding with regard to what it is, what it means, uh, what we should expect from it, uh, et cetera. So that's, that's always one of the challenges we have to take on in a, in a discussion around the Grand Bargain. I think just a couple of reminders of where we started. It, it, it did grow out of the 2016 World Humanitarian Summit, an associated high-level panel uh, document, too important to fail. Uh, we're, whereas we, as I said, in the, the Grand Bargain 2.0 stage now, with, with a clear focus on better humanitarian outcomes for affected populations through enhanced efficiency, effectiveness, and greater accountability. That's a pretty high-level goal uh, to take on through an initiative like the Grand Bargain, but I think you can see already in some of the discussions we've had, we've had today, um, still very relevant uh, aspiration that we take on. There were 51 commitments in the original Grand Bargain, uh, not a small group of commitments. Uh, so it's, it's a big job. Those were eventually organized into 11 core commitments around 10 key areas of work, and I won't list them all but I think uh, they would all resonate well with the discussions that we've had both today and, and continue to be ongoing in the humanitarian space. So transparency, localization, quality funding, needs assessment, how to reduce administrative burdens, how we better share risks. So it's clear that the topics we cover in the Grand Bargain, I think, continue to be relevant. We're now up to 66 signatories. Uh, many of the organizations represented here today uh, are in fact signatories of the Grand Bargain. Um, so, it, so it is a, a, a document, a platform, a set of commitments that involves most of us here uh, in how we carry forward with our work. One of the greatest strengths of the Grand Bargain uh, is that it is a unique platform involving quite a range of humanitarian stakeholders. So within the Grand Bargain constituencies, we call them, we have donors represented, we have Red Cross, Red Crescent movement represented, we have the UN represented, 
Uh, we have NGOs represented, both INGOs and local partners. So it's, it's a unique platform in that it involves a, a range of stakeholders on, on an equal basis that is not really replicated in any other current system. So it is important that we ask the question how we can make the most of that unique platform. Part of the challenge in engaging with that range of stakeholders is uh, how we ensure that we're working collectively, uh, what it looks like to have what we call the quid pro quo within the grand bargain. So how do we take collective action, understanding that if we do act together as that group of stakeholders, we can achieve more than we would if we were just acting as, as individuals in the humanitarian space. So how have we done so far? Uh, each year we do an independent assessment of the grand bargain. ODI has helped us do that uh, for the last, I think, five years. Um, there's a strong sense that we have, in fact, pushed farther, pushed farther than we might have otherwise uh, if we didn't have the grand bargain in place. Uh, so it has been a useful tool to push discussion, action in many of these areas faster than we might have otherwise. Uh, we do have some clear areas of success. Uh, we, we heard uh, this morning already some great indications of how uh, we have in fact moved farther in flexibility of funding, reducing earmarking, uh, some of the, the core quality funding efforts within the grand bargain. Uh, but also clear that we have the call to push farther, uh, the call to make funding more predictable, uh, to really make funding more accessible to our local partners, and continue to fulfill the, the commitments of the grand bargain that, uh, that really are designed to change how we work uh, and make a difference at the field level, at the country level. So again, this question, how can we make the most effective use of the grand bargain to improve the state of humanitarian finance? I hope the panel that we have here today can help us dig a little bit farther into that question. Uh, we have you as well, participants in the audience, to help push us in that direction as well. So I hope as we go through the, the start to the panel here, you can be thinking of your questions, of the points you'd like to raise uh, to the panel, and we'll include you in the discussion as well. So we're, we're pleased to have with us uh, Ms. Kelly Clements, uh, Deputy High Commissioner for UNHCR, uh, Mr. Predreg Avramovich, Minister Council for Humanitarian Affairs with the EU delegation here in Geneva, uh, Ms. Marta Garcia Valdez, Director of Humanitarian Programs um, with the Oxfam Global Humanitarian Team, and Mr. Jamil Abdo, who's CEO of the Tamdeen Youth Foundation in Yemen. Uh, we welcome you to the panel discussion today. So, to get into our discussion, uh, our UN partners in the Grand Bargain do play a unique role, uh, both as recipients of funding um, and as one of the biggest funders for NGO partners in particular. Uh, UNHCR has been closely engaged with the Grand Bargain uh, from the original negotiations, um, also leading work stream implementation, joining caucuses, uh, currently serving on the facilitation group as well. So Kelly, I want to turn to you for your perspective from UNHCR. Where do you see us headed with the Grand Bargain? What's your reception on the, the future direction that we could head in uh, towards that, that ultimate goal of how we can make it a more effective tool? Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremy, and greetings to everybody. It's nice to see you here in person here at the Graduate Institute and, and to do this, obviously, um, with uh, ICFA, uh, ICFA's platform is always a wonderful opportunity to see so many old friends and, and meet new ones. Um, and it's an incredible network, which obviously we have enjoyed a very strong partnership for many, many years. Um, so, you know, as I was thinking about the panel today, and I actually thought Jan Eglin might be joining us, our eminent person, because I, I think as we talk about the future, we'll talk a little bit about what's happened over the last uh, year, year plus, in terms of the, that 2.0 that you talked about, Jeremy, in terms of 
the, where the original notion of the grand bargain uh, was created in 2016 and how it's evolved. And you mentioned 66 different signatories. I know like you and those of you that are signatories in the room, you, you took time to consider, could you sign up? Could you make the commitments? Could you deliver the promises? Uh, where did you want to see this particular group go? And that quid pro quo, which we could talk about a little bit maybe in the, in the questions and answers, was there, is there, it, does it exist, you know, in the current uh, scenario? And I think, you know, the, it's, there, there are discussions now uh, positive and maybe those that want to see more and want to see more out of this unique group, as you've mentioned. I, I had the privilege and the opportunity, uh, and it was only after just a few months in this job uh, as Deputy High Commissioner, of, of leading the UNHCR delegation in Istanbul uh, in 2016, a little unexpectedly. And there was a piece of paper that was put in front of me by organizers that said, you know, we're going to, we're going to launch this and we're going to launch it here, where I didn't know much about, to be quite honest, what the grand bargain was all about. I knew, of course, the high-level panel, what, what was anticipated in terms of the state of the humanitarian system, the, the issues related to our need to, to shrink the need, increase the resource base, and all of that. But this very important, what turned out to be really transformative um, line of effort that we've all undertaken and to, to really try to dig down as to how do you change and fundamentally change a system um, that has been set up over decades in order to, to better support uh, the people that we serve with putting those people obviously clearly at the center of our work. And it was highly organized, um, very process uh, heavy in some instances in terms of driving some of that change. And many of us have taken the, the grand bargain principles and then reflected that in our own organizations. And if you know anything about UNHCR, uh, the UN Refugee Agency, you know that over the last six years or so, and I would not say it's a, 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 an, an accident or a coincidence that somehow the grand bargain and UNHCR's transformation have been very much hand in hand. Uh, we have undertaken pretty much at every level within the organization um, an entire change, uh, an entire transformation from the way that we're structured, putting decisions much closer to the people that we serve, trying to break down the hierarchy and the centralization that is uh, unfortunately a bit associated with us as a large and complex organization with a very specific mandate uh, to you know, the, what, what some of us would call to changing all the internal plumbing and as partners of ours, you know that we're not, we have not traditionally always been the easiest of partners to work with. We can be quite cumbersome in terms of the requests for proposals or the reports that are required and so on, which meant, in, and then of course the, the third piece, I'll tell you why that, that internal plumbing piece is important, but the third piece, which is the, the culture piece. How do we change the way that we work? How do we change the way that we, we, we work together uh, in terms of individuals and organizations, mutual respect? You know, I was reminded earlier as we were coming into the room that just a year after the grand bargain in 2017, there was a very important uh, agreement that was also if very much, uh, I think, uh, uh, very complementary to the grand bargain on the principles of partnership. And we had undergone really quite an introspective look what kind of a partner are we as an organization? And I think for those of you that, that uh, come to our, our global NGO discussions and our now regional discussions, um, you know that we want to do a temperature check every year. How are we doing? Are we getting better? Um, and there are data points that are associated with that. But the culture piece and the, the partnership piece becomes extraordinarily important. So we have used the grand bargain, Jeremy, in a way that is, and I think, I hope that this is the future of the grand bargain as well, that in, uh, forgive, forgive if some take offense at this, but the grand bargain should not be a talk shop. It should not be a place where we come and, and reflect on, on the great issues and we walk away without action-oriented points or without clear direction in terms of how, what, what the goal is and how we're gonna get there and holding ourselves to account and help holding ourselves to very, very high standards in terms of getting there. 
and that is UNHCR. We have taken that very personally, and we've taken that and, and put it within our own execution of the grand bargain. And let me just give you a, a, a few examples of that. We set a commitment in 2016 that we were going to reach 25% of program exp expenditures that would go to local or national partners. Uh, we exceeded that in the first year. We're now at 54%, um, and we think we can go even higher. Of the partners that we have, 84% are national or local partners. And again, that is an extraordinarily important statistic for us because it also needs to represent how do we relate with that, that broader world with, with our partners. Um, and there are partners, of course, that are not just fiduciary partners. There are partners that are strategic and policy-related partners and others that obviously add uh, to, to our delivery very operationally, but also if we're trying to change uh, a, a, uh, a dialogue that has becoming uh, increasingly toxic, increasingly polarized, where um, refugees are, are sometimes seen in that polarized universe as the cause or the crisis in and of themselves, as opposed to a symptom uh, or a survivor of that, that crisis. We need to change completely the, the dynamic. And with that, we need lots of partners. So it's no mistake that we have you know, 1,100 partners uh, right now that, that we're very privileged to work with. We took extremely seriously the, the, the uh, change, and again, within the humanitarian system, I think this has really been something, and we've taken it further under Jan's leadership as imminent person, on cash. Um, in the, in, you'll have looked at our report, we're, we're now above that, but when the report was issued, we were just shy of $1 billion to 10 million people. Um, in, in some of our big operations, Afghanistan a good example, certainly the Ukraine situation, we've taken the, the, the metamorphosis and the change in terms of cash to the next level. And so within the system, I think, we've also seen a big push in the last year, and particularly with regard to the cash platform, some of the changes that as a system are, are only to the positive. The fact that we've got standard tools, the fact that in 27 countries we're using the same system, and that we have now routinely in any emergency response a common way to look at market access. And all of this, of course, is to the positive. If you've got you know, 1,100 people all doing different assessments and starting from a different baseline, you're not going to make the lives of people better. You're going to, to sow confusion, if not worse. Um, Issues that we've taken internally with regard to localization, and I understand that that was a big discussion this morning in your opening panel, um, but it's something that we've been very privileged to, to push within the system, uh, including uh, in the rubrics of the Interagency Standing Committee, partnering with many of the organizations actually here in the room with us. Um, I think we've done some really important work together. Internally, we are trying to change the, the way that we um, engage the people that we serve in a meaningful way. And I think, I hope in the discussion we can talk about what does meaningful engagement mean to you? We've had, um, we've had reflections of that in, in our organization and certainly in the grand bargain context that we need to take even further. We've taken some steps and even coincidentally this week, uh, having the first in-person discussion with our newly constituted advisory board. It's a board of 16 of refugee-led, uh, displaced-led, stateless-led, uh, those that um, are, are um, dedicated uh, to disability, to LGBTQI, to others. They are now representing a large um, ecosystem which will influence policy, decision-making, resource allocation, and the like within the organization. I think this is a very positive step. It's, it's, it's inclusive in its nature. Um, we have changed the way that we uh, implement grants and, and grant agreements. I mentioned this issue in terms of partnership, and we knew that we are a complex organization to work with. So how do we make that easier, particularly for local community-based organizations to access resources that we might have at our disposal? And that's something that uh, we're making uh, concerted progress, I think, with, 
with a certain, and we can go into this a little bit in the Q&A if people are interested, we now have specific ways to be able to grant specific allocations of resources to communities that are doing related work. Um, and we have been able to, to um, issue and execute over 70 of them uh, in this last year alone, and we're on a good track in terms of the, the way forward. We have also, I think you've seen us launch an innovation fund for those refugee-led organizations. Again, bringing ideas that have been very important in a local or, a, or a, a regional context to the global stage. And this is something that we've seen a unanimous um, support. So getting to your, your uh, question, Jeremy, in terms of the future. Where I, again, want to pay tribute to the person who's not on the panel with us, which is Jan. I think the direction that we took to take the grand bargain into what was a bit more of a political space and a more focused space was the right way to go. Focusing on intermediaries, cash, localization, quality financing, all of those areas were ones that frankly with our community of grand bargain signatories, we were not making enough progress fast enough. And increasingly, we were having conversations where we were going in circles or talking in technicalities, which really wasn't moving the needle of change. And so I already mentioned the, 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 what we've, we've done so far on cash, for example. I think we've made important steps forward on localization. Frankly, I think we can be much more specific in metrics oriented. Again, commitments from everybody about what they're willing to do and holding ourselves and the community to account. Uh, we can take that even further. Where we haven't made as much progress is on uh, quality financing and quality funding. We were having a discussion uh, yesterday actually with, with our, our sister friends at, at WFP about financing and the, the resource world that we see in 2023 and 2024. And actually, uh, coincidentally or not, since the grand bargain was launched, actually the amount of unrestricted or flexible support coming to UNHCR has decreased. Now, not to put my friend from the European Union on the spot, but this would be one of those areas we would see in the future that would be very important to be donor-led. Uh, because I think there is so much that comes in the political space with parliaments, for example, Congress, others where either there are siloed approaches taken between humanitarian and development action or the restrictions in terms of regional or country or sectoral uh, restrictions are put on that, that really go beyond what we can do, certainly, uh, as, a, as a UN organization, and, and I would suspect others are the same. We are huge fans of the Grand Bargain, uh, very actively uh, engaged, as you've mentioned, as a, and as I've just noted. We do think after 10 years come up, and we've got three years to go, so I think we should have a sense of urgency, we consider whether this platform is the right one to continue to really move the needle. Um, I think it's a unique one given all the voices that are involved. Do you need to have something though that actually gets you the decisions you need to take, particularly with a group as diverse? And so I think, you know, we, we still have a lot of work to do, so I'm not sure that we need to, you know, write the last chapter yet. Um, but I think we really do need to keep the pressure on ourselves to make the kind of political commitment and then have it followed up in our respective agencies with action. That's only how we're going to see change. Thanks very much. Excellent, thank you very much for those comments, Kelly. I think a, a couple of things struck me in particular, both the, the call for the Grand Bargain to be a platform that is not just a talk shop, but actually we, we use it as a tool to make change in the system, and, and that involves being specific with the milestones, the objectives, what we want to achieve, having the structure to do it. Uh, but, at, but at the same time, the importance of driving culture change, right? So it's not just a technical exercise, those are important, but also does have to, in some way, affect the broader culture of our organizations uh, in, in how we carry forward. So I think some very helpful comments and, and I hope some good food for thought for the, for the Q&A as well. Thank you for those comments. Predrag, as, as, with, uh, as with UNHCR, uh, EU, ECHO have been engaged really since the, since the start with the Grand Bargain. I was looking in advance and I think 
you might have had the most time spent on the facilitation group over the years. So really has been quite closely engaged with uh, how we guide the grand bargain from the facilitation group level, um, obviously representing the donor perspective in that group as well. Can you share with us how the EU sees the, sees the grand bargain from your, from your donor perspective? What is your view on, on where we need to go? Um, and how do you see the grand bargain affecting uh, the funding that comes out from EU or the donor perspective in general? Over to you. Thank you, Jeremy, and good morning, colleagues. Uh, very pleased to be here with you. And indeed, Jeremy, the EU, and more specifically its humanitarian branch, ECHO, which I have the privilege to represent here in Geneva, uh, has been a champion of the grand bargain ever since the inception back in 2016. And this is not only because our then dear boss, Kristalina Georgieva, had co-chaired the high-level panel on humanitarian financing and very much helped broker this agreement. Uh, and indeed, as Jeremy has said, we have remained on this track ever since through uh, very uh, con continued solid engagement to support the Secretariat here, uh, but also the facilitation group and all the different, well, all, not all, but many of the work streams and caucuses. Now, clearly for us, uh, the added value of this initiative is very clear, and it is the most inclusive initiative to ensure the efficiency but also the effectiveness of humanitarian action and it is the only structured initiative gathering donors and doers so us donors and you doers uh, we don't really have another place to, to to sit and discuss these things and this is why in beyond the original efficiency targets um, using the platform to advance also on effectiveness and on some indeed systemic issues may be uh, the right way to go. Uh, and clearly, uh, the, today the, the funding gap is much bigger than it was in 2016 uh, and even more than when the deal was struck. We need to continue working on all the strands of action of the original uh, report on humanitarian financing to uh, increase the funding, to reduce the needs and to do more with what we have. That is the efficiency, the core part of the grand bargain. Um, and indeed, as Jeremy has recalled, uh, a lot of progress has been made uh, on some of the commitments uh, and a lot more remains to be done, whether as regards localization uh, or indeed quality funding. Um, I will illustrate briefly how we have tried and I continue to try to advance on both of these um, and then try to look into the crystal ball uh, on the future of the grand bargain. So uh, as a donor, we are trying hard to do our part. And I suspect that ICVA has invited some of the most uh, difficult partners, both donors or UN agencies, to, to talk about this uh, with the logic of if we can do it, anyone can do it. Um, now, let me speak of quality funding uh, and localization. Quality funding, first of all. Um, we have managed to increase greatly our multi-year funding and we have the ambition to increase this to 30% of our portfolio by next year uh, in areas where such longer time frames are clearly justified, education, protracted crisis, and so forth. Um, but also we have managed to materialize more flexible funding in the so-called programmatic partnerships with selected partners, whether UN, NGO, or Red Cross, uh, and in these pilot no longer pilot, really, because we've had them now for four years. Uh, in these PPs, funding is provided multi-year and multi-country with additional flexibility to pursue some key policy objectives. Now, it is fair to say that at least for the moment, for us, quality funding can still not mean provide the money and the doer makes it up as they go along. Uh, but of course, even if we found a way which we for the moment cannot do to provide such completely unearmarked funding to UN agencies, uh, it is unlikely that the UN agencies would be able to pass it on to you all uh, as unearmarked. Uh, but still, we are serious about advancing on this, advancing on multi-year, advancing on multi-country, and making gradually uh, flexibility further increased. Now, localization is the other key strand of the, of the Grand Bargain 2.0. Uh, and there again, we 
remain very committed to uh, increase our support to local responders, uh, which is a commitment to reiter reiterated also in our communication of 2021, uh, which is essentially redefining our policy framework. Now, importantly, as you well know, we still have to recall that our legal basis does not allow us at this stage uh, to provide funding directly to organizations established outside the EU. Short of such direct funding, we are doing just about everything else we can. So we have, of course, as member of the caucus for funding for localization, uh, trying to broker this political agreement with all signatories to reach the target of 25% uh, of funding to local and national actors as directly as possible, and at a later stage to also address the issue of cascading of indirect costs. And we are pushing this agenda also in the caucuses on intermediaries and quality funding. And last but not least, we have issued, or we are issuing literally today, our updated guidance on localization. Uh, with its full name, Promoting Equitable Partnerships with Local Responders in Humanitarian Settings. And this guidance will be formally presented at the European Humanitarian Forum in Brussels on Monday. Uh, and I believe many of you will be going to the forum, so you will be hearing this uh, more on this from my boss. Uh, and this guidance was announced already at last year's forum, and it will be one of the key deliverables of the forum on, on Monday. So without preempting too much what, what will be said of the guidance, let me underscore a couple of important points there. First, this guidance is the result of a consultative process, and we had over 600 NGOs contributing in the first phases of consultation, and we had targeted consultations on the initial drafts, so this should not come as a surprise to, to most of you. Second, the approach uh, is context-oriented and incentive-based to try and encourage and prioritize localization. So when similar proposals are received for our funding, we will privilege the ones that best promote localization agenda. Uh, now, not that localization becomes an end in itself, as we still aim to achieve additional efficiency gains in the delivery of assistance through localization. And third, on the key objectives and content of this guidance. The guidance is both to all of you, ECHO partners, uh, NGOs, UN agencies, Red Cross, and to our own staff to remind uh, how exactly we intend to deliver on our commitments, to clarify everybody's expectations, and it will be applicable already from the next program cycle. Uh, we are seeking through this guidance to increase the impact, to transfer knowledge, to increase efficiency, effectiveness, and to uh, facilitate the exit of international humanitarian partners um, in line with the initial spirit of making the response as local as possible and as international as necessary. Uh, so the guidance will aim to recognize the value, skills and resources of the local partners and to establish more equitable partnerships including more equitable sharing of overheads to which local and national actors must have better access. Uh, and the objective, of course, is to arrive to allocate at least 25% of humanitarian funds as directly as possible, and that means through maximum one intermediary, to local and national actors. And we will be seeking in parallel to ensure also more direct channels of communication between us and local actors, to enhance advocacy and work on the side on risk sharing and capacity strengthening. And we hope that this guidance will be welcomed by you all. It should go online in the course of today. Okay, so let me conclude now on the future of the grand bargain, looking ahead. You know that we are a member of the facilitation group and we are contributing actively to ongoing negotiations on the future of the grand bargain. Um, and uh, on Monday, we, uh, as ECHO, together with Germany as members of the facilitation group, will ho we'll host an informal meeting at principles level uh, as a key milestone to build momentum towards the June meeting. And of course, at the annual meeting in June, we will have clarity on where this is going, and we should by then have a new eminent person taking over from Jan Egeland. Now, uh, this also means that I can, of course, not enter into uh, timeline structure uh, that will be discussed further, 
but it is safe to say that from our perspective, um, the grand bargain process needs to continue. It needs to deliver on its remaining efficiency promises, and it needs to collaboratively address some of the other challenges we face today. Because at the strategic level, uh, while we continue to ensure the implementation of the existing commitments, the grand bargain, we believe, could also be a catalyst towards a system-wide transformation. So, from our perspective, the next iteration of the grand bargain needs to build on the inclusiveness of the process and on collaborative efficiency, and I will explain. On inclusiveness, of course, the process must continue involving the wider humanitarian community and fostering the participation also of local organizations in the decision-making processes, uh, as Kelly has also illustrated, uh, has been the approach also inside UNHCR. Um, and the collaborative efficiency, uh, this means essentially getting closer to the initial spirit of quid pro quo i.e. the initial bargain between the donors and the doers, with each delivering on their side of the bargain in this spirit. And if I may quote another process, it is in a way a common but differentiated responsibility, as some commitments can only be delivered by us donors and others only by the doers and some by both, all sets of humanitarian actors working together. And just like we will be serious about delivering on our commitments, we will be expecting all the others to do the same. So I will stop here, but I will be very happy to revert to some of this in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Predrag. I, I hope you warned the IT department at uh, EU that there might be a massive influx of searches for localization <laughs> guidance on Friday afternoon. Uh, but I think that's, that's welcome news. It'll be quite interesting, I think, to, to follow up on that and see, uh, see that new guidance released. And, and thank you as well for sharing more on the, really the intended direction. Oh, there, it's... <laughs> It's on, it's on camera now. <laughs> yeah, thank you as well for some of the updates on, on where uh, ECHO EU is headed in terms of the focus on multi-year, multi-country programming as well. I know that is a, a key uh, priority among many NGO colleagues too. So uh, again, I think some good food for our discussion uh, to continue. Now I'd like to, to shift to the, to the NGO perspective uh, Marta, first, uh, over to you, as Oxfam has been closely engaged with a number of key discussions across grand bargain areas. I know you and I have worked closely together on uh, Nexus, financing the Nexus areas of work. Uh, Oxfam has also closely been engaged on some of the questions around how we cascade uh, overhead funding, among other areas. So I'd like to turn it over to you. Uh, improved access to quality funding in particular is one of the core areas, uh, core priorities of the Grand Bargain. Uh, what are some of the challenges and opportunities you see from the NGO perspective when it comes to fulfilling this priority around quality funding and how we might take that forward in the Grand Bargain? Over to you. Thank you, Jeremy. And uh, hi, everybody. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, so before going into this question, I wanted as well, because I think there is a very good practice, the idea to, to discuss and to, to be very transparent on the results of the grand bargain on each one of our agencies and, and our way of working. And definitely, I can say that in Oxfam, we have been working on what we call a transformation journey, because it is not only about procedures, so I cannot uh, agree more on that, it's about culture. And changing culture, changing behaviors, ways of working, and power dynamics is the most challenging and difficult thing that we are facing. Because it takes time, and uh, changing those approaches may even imply important and very difficult decisions in the organizations. Having said that, I think that we are moving, I mean, in our commitment to the uh, locally led uh, responses, we are moving, I wouldn't say, as fast and as homogeneous as we would like to be moving, but we are moving. We are as well very committed to review our internal policies and practices in relation to the sharing of overheads, because it's right that we are not doing as we should. 
and we are as well discussing about how we can reduce due diligences and how we can harmonize that with another, other groups of NGOs to see if that can ease the process. If we want to be more efficient as a system, we need to be more efficient as individual organizations. So we are definitely moving in this, in this direction. And we are, we are Oxfam, we are very involved in all the discussions at the sector level to try to influence key agendas. And one of the agenda is, is the funding and the quality funding. But going back to the grand bargain, because I will, I will touch on the quality funding afterwards, but when, I, when we were reflecting about the grand bargain, um, we, were working, we were wondering, is that worth it? We have been in this journey for the last six years and a half, and uh, I think that is a good time to stop and think about what are the positives and what are the, need, the things that need to be potentially transformed, reshape, or potentially revamp. It will depend on the analysis. But there has been positive. I think that the fact that we are here today, all of us are speaking about the ground bargain, is a positive. Yeah? If we want to change and transform the sector, the voices should be inclusive. We can change and transform the sector just having one part of the sector speaking to each other. And definitely, we cannot transform the sector without having conversations at the country level, at the regional level, where the action is taking place. So I think that if I can take one of the big successes of the grand bargain is that the network of organizations that are part of it, that speak to it and raise the voice is more diverse than ever. And there is no platform that is so diverse than that. But does it mean that the grand bargain is succeeding? Well, if I put myself back in 2016 on the expectations we were having, and I wonder very honestly to myself if we are succeeding, I will have to say that not to the extent that I was expecting and not to the extent that I think all of us we were expecting. Yeah. So maybe we need to an uh, analyze what is the positive and the beauty of the grand bargain and what are the things that grand bargain is not managing to solve. And, uh, and like that, we could be thinking about how that can serve all, all of us. So in the last iteration of the grand bargain, I think that out of this big list of commitments that we gave ourselves to transform the sector, in the last iteration, we focus on the political challenges. And we maintain the technical work, but focus on the political challenges. I think that the grand bargain needs to think about efficiency as well. As a sector, and as the previous panel was speaking, we professionalize heavily over the last 15, 20 years. And we have developed a lot of institutional and a number of critical initiatives. Can we build further efficiency? I think so. Maybe the grand bargain doesn't need to have any technical specific work and need to build on the technical specific work that is going on in other initiatives, um, projects, initiatives, and even institutions that are working on learning. Uh, today we discuss about accountability to affected population. There are specific organizations working on that. We don't need to redouble the effort, but we need a platform. We need a platform to make choices. We need a platform to be able to be sharper, because we need to be sharper. We can't uh, deliver on all the things that we gave us to deliver. We have not managed to deliver in the last six years on all of them um, in a good level. So maybe we need to choose what are the real game changes that we need to select all together and that we need to deliver all together. Because otherwise, we, we, risk, we are taking the risk to decide that the grand bargain is redundant because we are not managing to transform. And I think that we need to be sharper and we need to be very strategic about what is the change that together we want to make in order to make the agenda um, more adequate and to become more efficient. And then it comes to this question, we were discussing about the grand bargain focusing at efficiency as one of the key challenges, and the high-level panel on, on humanitarian uh, financing that took place before the grand bargain. Are we more efficient? I mean, if I take a look to our organization, if I take a look to Oxfam, in some aspects we can be more efficient, but in other aspects we are not being as efficient as we would like to be. Can we say that as a sector we are more efficient when we have the frontliners, yeah? 
that are not receiving more flexible funding and are not receiving overhead uh, money in order to ensure that they can have space and they can have time to be engaging in the conversations that are transforming the sector. It's a big question. For me, efficiency starts there as well. Are we efficient? Are we setting up partnerships that are following good partnership principles? Or are we setting only transactional partnership? That's another good question that we should be asking ourselves when we are speaking about transforming how we are. So I think that there is still time and there is still room for improvement in terms of efficiency, in terms of reducing uh, administrative workloads, in, in terms of reducing reporting uh, requirements and definitely due diligences. Um, there is a question of building trust as well and trusting on, on other organizational systems. But then today, and I think that we have been discussing over the last three uh, years about unprecedented situations. I remember before the COVID, it was very unprecedented because the number of, of displaced population was higher than ever. Then after COVID came, and it was unprecedented because it was a pandemic. Yeah. And now, is, last year was very unprecedented because of the Ukraine conflict and what was going on. It's not unprecedented anymore. We know that we are going in a direction that needs are big and resources are limited. And then this is where the discussion about the quality funding and the nexus comes into the plate. Um, I'm not... Over the, a long, long period, we have discussing about humanitarian system failing. Is really the humanitarian system failing? Could be, yeah. What is clear is that we don't have the capacity to face the needs. But this morning, we hear uh, a colleague from Afghanistan saying that Afghanistan was on humanitarian aid for very long without development investments. Yeah? Humanitarian aid per se cannot change uh, the root causes. We cannot address the root causes of need. And this is why we need the development uh, funding to come and now more and more the climate funding to come. And we are not going to manage to have the, fun the, the funding coming if the conversation is only taking place among humanitarians. Yeah? So maybe an area to go for the grand bargain is to extend the focus to work on the really pressing issues like the funding, but bringing others to the conversation. We want development actors to be less risk adverse and come and invest in communities at the same time that we can cover needs. And that is important as well as climate. So I think that it is about sharpening and is about ensuring that we are all together in the same space and that we bring more um, prominence to the country reference group that has been set to drive the conversation. So I think that definitely we need the grand bargain because if we declare that the grand bargain is redundant, let's be real, we will have to recreate another platform. So let's not destroy what could be working but let's try to see how we can work better by sharpening, by maintaining the inclusivity and by ensuring that we open to other actors, we bring them and we are able to extend the humanitarian and share the burden with quality funding that will, by the end, redound in a better humanitarian response. Excellent. Thank you very much, Marta. I think some, some good points to provoke us to think a little farther. I like what you say about efficiency. It's one of the objectives of the grand bargain, but how, how are we being efficient in the grand bargain itself uh, in terms of really sharpening our focus, using the tool effectively, um, and, and leveraging, uh, leveraging in ways that will really change the system, especially, uh, especially at the country level and connecting better with those uh, with those groups engaged there. So I think some very good uh, provocations for us to be considering and think further. Uh, thank you for those comments. Jamil, now I'd like to, to give it over to you. You've heard some very interesting comments from the other panelists. I'm sure you have your own thoughts on uh, Grand Bargain and what it may or may not be at the country level. Um, ultimately, as you heard early on, the, the goal of the Grand Bargain is in fact uh, to improve outcomes for, for those most affected by humanitarian crises. Um, and obviously for that to happen, there has to be action at the country level 
involved in the work that we carry on through the Grand Bargain. So from your perspective, what do you see as some of the top uh, finance priorities at the country level? And I, and I think importantly is, do you see the Grand Bargain as present in the country level from your perspective? Is that something we need to improve on? And if so, how? Over to you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, your journey and uh, for the panelists. Uh, I am so happy that uh, donor uh, UN agencies and international organization, they realize that there is an issue uh, with the grant money and they want to change and they want to drive that change. So the, uh, realizing the issues uh, and admitting that there, wa there is an issue is the, the beginning of uh, the solution. So <laughs> from, the country, uh, from the country perspective and f uh, about the, lo uh, the local voice, uh, I, I am so uh, happy that the behind the, the, uh, the quantity of the finding, the quantity of funding that we have to be, uh, to be more effective funding, uh, that we have to be flexible, and which, which has been mentioned also regarding the multi-year uh, funding. Uh, also being uh, reducing or simplify the due diligence process. Uh, as mentioned in uh, the previous panel that most, uh, most of the local uh, organization, they are working in the hard to reach area. And it's, sometimes it's too difficult for them uh, to pass the due diligence process. So not, uh, not meaning that uh, it, it's, it will be more beneficial uh, that we simplify the, the donor uh, due diligence process. As this, uh, this process uh, will make it easier for the local NGOs in the hard to reach area uh, to get the fund and uh, uh, response to uh, the, the needs over there. Not meaning that the simplified uh, uh, the, the due diligence process uh, without taking the required safeguarding to, me, uh, to, to ensure that uh, the, uh, the funding is uh, being used appropriately. Also, uh, it, it's good to hear that uh, EU that starting uh, implementing the new localization guideline and maintaining that the guideline, uh, uh, that guideline that will help uh, the local NGOs to get uh, the uh, access to the funding by uh, the EU. Uh, especially uh, when uh, they said that they, they will try to get uh, uh, the approval to go direct funding to the local NGOs. Sometimes, uh, sorry to, so say that, but sometimes uh, when you, uh, it's much easier to go direct to the local NGO instead of uh, going through uh, like uh, international NGO to, uh, because uh, most of the fund uh, or say 30 to 40 percent of the fund will go to administrative work while we need these funds. Uh, we, there is, we, we, we realize that there is a lack of fund, there is a lack of uh, uh, resources, and there is an, an increase in the need. So uh, when we starting, uh, when you starting to implement or uh, giving the access to the fund directly to the local NGOs that will improve uh, uh, their response, also will increase the beneficiaries uh, of this uh, uh, fund. At the country level, uh, the implementation of the grant bargaining has been mixed. Uh, some countries have uh, seen significant progress in the term of localization, uh, partnership, and transparency, while others still struggling, uh, achieving the objectives. The grant bargaining uh, has brought attention to the need of the more in uh, investment in local organization and important of having more coordination approach uh, to humanitarian aid. It's also uh, encouraged donors uh, to be more flexible uh, in their funding and to prioritize the needs and, uh, of, effective, uh, of affected communities. For example, in Yemen, the grant bargaining has led, some progress, had, has led to some progress uh, uh, 
in improving the humanitarian response. For example, there, there has been increased focus in localizing aid, also, uh, which, which means supporting the local organization and the system delivering aid, and increase in the use of cash transfer uh, instead of in-kind uh, assistance. This not that uh, this uh, this not uh, doesn't mean that th there is some action in the ground. There is a realization that the uh, the people uh, the people or the local NGOs uh, who who is knowing their context, knowing the uh, knowing uh, the context, knowing the need, also involving the community on the response uh, is much uh, appreciated. Uh, the, uh, the, the localization. For example, uh, in Yemen, we, we, with support of ACFA, we establish or we do the localization baselining first. And I think, despite the difficulties, uh, we, we plan to finish the localization baselining in six months, but it takes hours uh, over a year. But with all the challenges we face, with all uh, the, the amount of coordination we made, we finally made it and issued the uh, first baselining report in Yemen. And I think uh, doing that in Yemen, with the context we have, we got two governments, we got a, a huge amount of uh, coordination needs to be done, and I think it can be done anywhere in Yemen. Thank you. Excellent, Jamil. Thanks for those comments. Uh, thanks for highlighting the baselining study in Yemen as well, not just because we were engaged in it, but I think it is a, it is a quite interesting effort in terms of actually how we crack some of the challenge of measuring uh, localization, which is in fact something that can be quite difficult to, to quantify. So I think that, that effort of baselining is one that is quite exciting in terms of potential to use elsewhere. Um, as well. And, and also, thanks for, uh, I think, highlighting some of the concerns around making efforts practical. So when we engage in uh, activities like reducing some of the administrative burdens on due diligence, etc., those are very practical needs of our local partners. Uh, and it doesn't mean sacrificing accountability, uh, right? It's, it's an exercise in simplification, but not reduction of accountability. And you can achieve both. So I think, thank you for those comments. Friends, it's, it's time to shift over. Uh, you've, you've had lots of interesting comments from the panel, and we want to make sure we take the rest of our time here to get some good uh, inputs from the audience as well. I already see some hands up, so we'll go, we'll go straight into some questions. I think I see... At the top here. Uh, top there, with hand raised in blue. Uh, then I'll come down here and get the question over here too. Yeah. Hi and good morning. Uh, my name is Hadi from Direct Aid Kuwait. Right here. Sorry. I'll stand up. And. Um, I'm trying to play the devil's advocate for the sake of uh, argument and to understand a little bit more. And my questions are raised uh, from Mrs. Garcia's point and Mr. Uh, Abdus' point. Um, you are questioning, Ms. Garcia, uh, the the, valid the validity and the uh, concrete, uh, concrete uh, evidence that you were thinking in 2016. But it is a, it's still an issue right now and uh, understanding the grand, uh, grand bargain. and. Mr. Abdu talked a little bit about how it's easier to find local NGOs and work with local NGOs, but it's not because local NGOs are not really uh, receiving as much exposure as they should be. And although um, there are administrative fees um, with international NGOs, but there also comes experience that they've built up uh, throughout the years. So what is the best um, way to have uh, international NGOs and local NGOs work together other than funding? Could it be partnerships? Uh, could it be um, corporate uh, funding to both of them? Or cooperation between both uh, to receive equal funding and work together, sharing experience and uh, field knowledge? Thank you. Excellent, thank you. We'll, we'll take a few questions here and then group. I think in, 
Yes. <laughs> Hello, thank you for uh, giving us the floor. I will be speaking on behalf of my uh, colleagues from West, and, uh, West Africa. And our first point is about uh, how the grain bargain uh, can really deliver on its promises. And we believe uh, there is a need to bring back the discussions on the ground. Uh, for instance, it was planned to create some local mechanisms um, such, as, such as national reference groups um, but uh, what we see in our region in West uh, Africa is that they, are, they, they doesn't exist or if, if so, uh, they aren't functioning. So how can we uh, improve that? That's the first point. And the second point, uh, um, the grain bargain for us is an important framework in which both national NGOs and international NGOs can discuss uh, humanitarian quality fundings and it should be maintained and strengthened. Um, but to increase humanitarian quality funding, there's a need also for a better tracking of humanitarian financing flows. We need more accountability on, on this aspect. Uh, we need more visibility on what's the amount of direct fundings, intermediate fundings, uh, or what's the real amount that is dedicated to uh, beneficiaries. Um, yes, and that's it. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. And I'm going to take I'm going to take one more from this side, and then we'll do it. We'll do another round. So, in the, yeah. thanks. So uh, this is Abir from NGO Platform, Coxal Bazar, Bangladesh. We are working uh, in the context of Rohingya refugee context. So, in the uh, during my uh, working, so I face uh, see some scenario. So, to this in my in my point of view. Uh, for the true localization uh, and the uh, effective uh, 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 value of uh, uh, value of money, effective uh, cost effectiveness, uh, social cohesion, and other things, uh, we could uh, engage with the local NGOs, those who are C C CSO or CBO. Actually, th uh, those who are response uh, in the local context, the local CSO and CBO are always response fast and other uh, national NGOs or international NGOs come later on. So firstly, they are uh, uh, involved in the situation and they know the whole context and how to mitigate the situation. So we see in the context, uh, some international NGOs, big uh, organization NGOs are directly implementing. At the same time, they are also working through their partners. But those who are CSU and CBO, small, small organizations, they are somehow missed uh, from the scenario. So in the name of uh, lack of capacity, small uh, shortage of uh, human resources, somehow they uh, don't categorize in the selection of the process actually. So from my uh, uh, opinion, uh, we need to include them uh, in the speed of uh, localization so that they could also engage in the whole response effectively, and they know how to uh, properly utilize the resource effect, uh, effectiveness of the scenario, actually. You know, the, in our context, we see the drug and uh, human trafficking and uh, uh, GBB uh, are doing now and then. So local and national, uh, international NGOs and local NGOs are working, but they don't know the whole scenario uh, uh, properly, how to mitigate and how to effectively implement in the process. So, uh, I think if you uh, include in the local NGOs, those who are uh, in the context, so they could uh, contribute properly and uh, mitigate the scenario. Uh, on the other hand, we, we sometimes we see, uh, see and heard that uh, they have no any capacity. Lord, uh, so. Uh, in, the, in that time, we could also connect them and organizational development capacity building like that way so that they could also uh, uh, contribute in this uh, aspect of the localization issues. So, yeah. So I think uh, for true partnership, effective uh, implementation, cost effectiveness, and other thing, we could 
others should uh, 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 local NGOs we could consider for the uh, localization aspect, I think. Excellent, thank you. Okay, well, we'll get at least one more round in so you can be prepared. I'll try and get uh, a few more that I saw. But let's go back to the panel for some responses. I think we had uh, a few curious. First, there was a, a question directed more towards uh, Jamil and Marta um, around what it might look like to do more shared collaboration between local and international on the NGO side. So I'll, I'll turn it over to the two of you if you want to comment there. And then I think a couple of points to come back for the whole panel to respond on, if you'd like. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, now, uh, even Yemen, the international NGO is starting to realize the power of uh, local uh, or national NGOs, that the, a lot of uh, NGO, uh, uh, INGOs in Yemen starting to partner with the lo uh, local NGOs and starting to empower them, uh, doing more, uh, more projects uh, throughout uh, the local NGOs. It's not uh, to the extent that they, g they give them the empower, but they still need uh, a lot of work needs to be done uh, with, uh, with them. That They have to realize that uh, they have to look for equal partnership, not a sub-implementing. Uh, involving them on the original design of the project during the uh, need assessment, uh, during uh, uh, starting uh, from the point zero, uh, starting uh, building their capacity also, uh, uh, also and in, uh, designing the whole process together. This, this will get them success also. The success of uh, uh, the local NGOs and also it's make uh, remarkable uh, success for the international NGO, such as uh, we got like Oxfam, uh, Safe Children, uh, Care, and all, all the most of the NGOs starting to realize this. But it's still uh, a lot of uh, a lot of work needs to be. Done. But at least it's started. So uh, the started point started, but we we realize that that there is an issue and there is a need to change. I think uh, that this process will be improved. So just a couple of, of compliments from my perspective. While we want to have those partnerships and we are working on those that are more horizontal, defining what we are going to do, not just transferring resources and transferring risks, but defining how we work and, uh, and how we share the agenda, but we are doing other changes. So for example, uh, giving the space uh, that normally we take to local actors. So before going into any international panel, we ask ourselves if we can give our space to a local organization, because I think that this is as well shifting power. We do that. We are as well committed to ensure that our partners can have a seat in humanitarian country teams where the decisions are expected to be made. So ensuring that they have a space there. And we had some nice uh, initiative, for example, one we, we did years ago in Colombia about providing resources to a woman right organization for them not to be implementing the response, but for them to be uh, part of the decision making at the regional level on how that the response needed to be. And potentially that can be more transformational. I think that good partnership means about speaking, listening and respecting roles and, uh, and willingness. So it takes time. It was said this morning, it takes time, it takes patience, it takes different type of skills. And in a lot of cases, it challenged us with our ambition to be timely. So potentially, for being timely and set up good partnership, we need to have kind of uh, different approaches and being operational in our first phase while we build partnership if we are not present, but ensuring that we transfer power, not just money and risks. Thank you, Marta. I can, I can turn it over to the others. If you haven't, I'll, I'll add a question in too. So if you want to respond to that point, you're welcome to. I think we had a couple of other good points that were interesting for the group as well. One around uh, the current national reference group structure. Uh, 
do they, do they practically exist? Uh, can we do more there? What should change in terms of country level engagement? I think you're welcome to respond to that. Uh, as well as the final point around um, some interesting comments on the Rohingya crisis in particular, but I think more, more generally the point that frequently local partners are in place and able to respond quickly, but what are we actually doing to, to enable that to happen? Is there something we can change there? So I'll leave it to the group if any of those strike your interest to respond. I'm happy to start, um, and I have to start just with a, a rapid but important clarification in case it was misunderstood, as uh, Jamal was kindly praising us for starting now to give money to local partners directly. Uh, we are not doing that. We are still not able to do that, unfortunately, okay? So as I, voila, as, as I was mentioning, uh, and this is a question of the legal basis, and it's not even northern versus southern organizations. We can also no longer finance, for example, UK-based NGOs. It has to be EU-based. So, um, and that legal basis is not changing anytime soon. Now, the localization guidance is the next best thing because it speaks to some of the points that some of you very eloquently presented here. Because it is not only about transferring funds directly, even though we want to strive to arrive at 25% as directly as possible, meaning one intermediary max. Okay, This cascading of intermediaries, which you also mentioned, um, it it's sometimes does not, not enough trickles down to the, uh, to the ones who are doing the uh, core work. And we know it, huh? the local partners are always the first to respond and sometimes the last and they will be there after the internationals pack up and go. So the, the point, and this is also uh, elaborating the guidance, is um, trying to, uh, to instruct our staff and partners, international partners whom we fund directly, how best to try and support this capacity building of the local partners, including through funding, but also through transferring expertise, knowledge, uh, and leaving that capacity behind. That I, I wanted to comment. Um, and I think uh, um, answering just also the comment from our colleague from West Africa. Um, yes, it is an important part of the total, having transparency on the flows, on the cost structure, on who assesses needs, how and who meets which needs in which manner, and what part of that. Uh, I would encourage you to reread the initial text of 2016 all the commitments that were in there, some of them got a bit lost, diluted along the way, but it's all in there, essentially. So, and it is an important part, and part of what I'm saying as a common but differentiated responsibility in everybody delivering on their parts, we can make, we can be a little bit less demanding on uh, funding, on reporting, and so forth, uh, and doers can be more transparent on costs, on needs, on lowering uh, administrative burdens, may being more efficient, and all of us can try to channel more, uh, a greater proportion directly through uh, local NGOs. Uh, one example for ECHO, I thought also some years ago we would never be contributing to pooled funds. We are now contributing to country-based pool funds initially in two, now in four theatres, because country-based pool funds can give money directly to local NGOs. So uh, important to, to, to go in, in these directions. And I'm just thinking, um, on reference groups, I, I wouldn't have much. I think it's important to implement uh, properly locally something which is context specific. And it, I think it's important to get ideas from the, from the field. Uh, but ultimately, it is the principles of the agencies which need to agree uh, between now and June sign up to something, roll it out to respective organizations, because then it will no longer be left to improvisation and individual decisions. Then it will be set in the operating principles of each of our organizations, and this is how we can really make more systemic progress. I pass to Kelly now, please. Thank you, thank you. There's not, not too much to add, because much has been said already, but a couple of things. One, I couldn't agree more with what uh, Frederick has just said in terms of Local actors, are the, they're there at the beginning, they're there at the end. And we've seen this time and time again in terms of responses. And so the more that our response net networks respect that, incorporate that, the f more effective we're going to be. And I think you see this, you know, we take particular leadership on the refugee response plans, and you see the breadth and the 
uh, diversity now in some of those response plans and the number of local partners now that are included. And I think that's a good evolution um, and we need to see more of it. The second is on, on this last point in terms of the national reference groups. There are a few, they're scattered. Uh, it is not a very organized effort yet, but I couldn't agree more with a colleague from, from West Africa that this is where we need to be going next in terms of making sure that the implementation and how we're each uh, living the commitments is actually happening at the, at the, uh, the national and the country level. Um, in, within the Grand Bargain Network, I think it's OCHA and NIR that have taken particular leadership on this point, and I think it can be part of that next step in terms of how do we make this more systemic. Thanks. Excellent, thank you for those responses. I think we can get in another round. So I, I saw, a, there's still quite a few hands. So we'll see, I think first here in Nemo, and then we'll, I'll go, I'll catch another one. Oh uh, yeah, sorry, I'll, I might get four, we'll try. Actually, I, I think Nemo first. Okay, go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, my, my voice is not so clear. Uh, I will be trying better to, to see. Uh, thank you for having this uh, opportunity. And uh, I'm, my name is Omar Jama from Zamzam Foundation, Somalia. I'm a national organization working in Somalia. Uh, really, um, oh, I think the, what we now discussing here, uh, I see a, I mean, uh, a good speech. And the, uh, the grand bargain is, uh, I mean, nice in the paper. Uh, but what we have, what we see in the reality on the ground, it's, it's not, I mean, we see as a kind of, uh, at least we can, we can call them, it's, it's not moving fast as, as needed. Um, uh, I mean, in, in, as a local organization or national organization, it's actually we, uh, we, we are there, uh, we're doing our job there. Um, but the, the promises that being done in, on, on priorities uh, are not more uh, delivered actually in, in the field. And, um, uh, the issue, actually, we, we are, what we are uh, just pushing forward is, uh, is simple. Are just the, we need, it's, it's not just if the funding. It's just it's the, I mean, the, the quality partnership, I mean, what uh, equity. Uh, you know, an NGO, international NGO, maybe a UN agency that's been working for a long time, for, for, uh, for centuries, maybe for, for years or for decades, and, and, and local organizations that never been given the opportunity uh, or maybe never have the, the, the same capacity, cannot be in, in the same page. Uh, it, that we, we see as, as that there's no equity on, on, on partnership, equality on partnership. Uh, actually, the, we, we don't care about the, the funding. The, the fund will, be, will, will come actually as, as you or as uh, the UN agents been, uh, I mean, working for that long, the, their capacity their, didn't come overnight. They, there's a long term capacity building that they have or injection of, of, of funding. So that's what we need actually. Uh, we actually promise that if we give them the opportunity, we as a local organization, we be delivering and as efficient as needed actually. Um, you know, we, we talked about that there's, uh, an, for example, now uh, some of organizations being and having um, delivering their, uh, I mean, local partners form of a, of a, of a six percent, maybe the funding going to the local partners. But we know, do we know that, uh, that 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 partnership? How is it? The the fund, the, the quality of the fund is, if that overhead or maybe the administrative, I mean, uh, budget needed being given, or is just the, as uh, as as is it in previous? Because you know, we, we, if you can, I cannot hire and a professional as, as the internet NGO want to hire, how, how can I do, I mean, um, I can deliver my job. So actually we, we, we need um, and more action than, than, I mean, speech and nice on paper. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, I, I can get two in here and then I'll try and get one more in quickly. So, I met one yeah, party first. <laughs> um, good, good, good morning, I think, or afternoon. Um, thank you very much for, um, to you, Ikfa, for organizing this wonderful 
um, dialogue and it's, it's really important to keep the conversation going at all levels, um, internally in our organizations, but also across in the various different stakeholders and partners that we work with. Um, I have a lot to say, but I will only say two things. Um, one is just asking the question of um, how do we internally as individual organizations marry the desire to grow and expand as an organization and the desire to address issues um, and humanitarian needs um, more principle, more impactful to the best placed institutions. So if we, I've heard this before in, in, in our, uh, from, from our panelists, but also for, from this panel, is that the affected community should be at the heart of our response. So now how do you then, you have a two contradicting ambitions. One is our organizations need to grow, whether we're UN or INGO. And then the other one is, well then how do we deliver those promises that we should be delivering and impacting the lives of the people we serve um, better? Um, so that's a question to, to you as panelists, if you can just see how you, as an, as an organization, have that ambition. Um, the other one is excellent. We all have collective uh, promises and uh, targets, but then how do we individually, because what we put in into those collective actions as individual institutions will eventually produce the collective required outcomes. Then how do we keep our organizations accountable to delivering these grand gestures that we're so good at making but not necessarily good at delivering to the best of our ability. So just those two questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you uh, from the Colombia Forum uh, of, of uh, Mixed Humanitarian uh, National and International NGOs. Thank you for, 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 for this panel and for this conversation. I, I, I will have two, two questions or remarks, I don't know. The first is great that the European Union and ECHO are moving uh, with the paper, the, the policy that you are going to present on, on Monday. By, but what still is pretty concernful is that there are political barriers, administrative barriers in the Congress or in the laws that still do not allow to go further in localization. And that at some point is transferred to UN agencies and to international NGOs. So this is something that we should consider on how to move, for example, in the European Parliament or, or in, in European National Congress to move from civil society because, as Ignacio mentioned, we also are civil society moving here and we need to keep that spirit to move those, those barriers. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, and maybe this could go to Mr. Griffith in the panel before, it, are country-based pool fund. Because country-based pool fund now are a minimum part of humanitarian response plans. And country-based pool fund, it's a direct way for local and national organizations to, uh, 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 to, to get the humanitarian funding. So we need to increase that beyond the 5-10% that uh, it's in an HRP. Maybe a country-based pool fund should uh, should consider of 30, 40% of the total HRP. That, that's something that we need to change also. And um, also with, 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 with flexibility. For example, with OCHA, we have some administrative barriers to open a country-based pool fund in a country unless you have secured more than $10 million uh, to open it. So we have in the system, we have our own um, uh, administrative barriers, and we need to overcome that and to address those tools to uh, each context, each country. Thank you. Thank you. I think I, I have to get one from the back. So uh, Tamara, I'll, I'll give it to you for a final question, and then panelists, I'll be back over to you uh, to, to wrap up. Thanks so much. 
Um, hi everyone, my name is Tamara Kertazovic and I lead the Grand Bargain Secretariat. First of all, uh, many thanks to Ikva and to Jeremy for convening this incredibly important discussion at a very relevant time for the Grand Bargain. Um, I'll be very brief. I just wanted to um, thank the panelists for very inspiring contributions. Um, I think in 2016, it, as it was already noted, the Grand Bargain uh, set for a very ambitious uh, agenda and we had very high expectations and I think we all expected it would be an overnight success but uh, the grand bargain cannot be an overnight success because it's a transformative change and I think what we heard today from the panelists are very specific examples of progress of UNHCR becoming a better partner, of ECHO increasing quality funding, of contributing to pooled funds, um, of Oxfam um, changing their overhead policies. So I would just like us to reflect whether all of this would have happened if there wasn't for the grand bargain and to use that as a foundation for the future um, for all of us. I know there's a lot of signatories in the room for us to reflect how, what, what does success look like for us in 2026? Um, what do we want to be able to say in 2026 that we achieved? Um, and what can our institution do to, to achieve that and to live up to those expectations? Um, I think we can be very powerful together and the examples from today really prove that. Um, so let's use the next three years to to, to set ourselves uh, for even uh, an even more ambitious future than uh, in the last six years. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for all your, uh, all your efforts. I think you're really making an important change, even uh, if incremental in, in, in some instances. Thank you. Thank you very much. So with that, I'll, I'll, do, I'll turn it over to the panel to take your pick of what you'd like to respond to, and you can wrap in some final comments uh, as you see fit as well. I think some very interesting uh, points back from the audience, but I'll, I'll leave it to you to, to pick what you'd like to follow up. Thank on. you. And realizing we're already over time, so I will, uh, I'll, I'll, I think the last comment was a wonderful way to wrap up, actually. <laughs> so thank you for that. I, I want to get to this point that was raised about the challenge between growth to respond to need and quality. Because I have to say from, from the UN Refugee Agency, we struggle with this every day. We are very different in the system in the sense that we offer the international community a snapshot of what we think in a particular year or multi-year as we're increasingly moving to. It's another one of our changes. The, the world as we see it in terms of humanitarian need for the people that we serve. So it's not just obviously about refugees, but also displaced in some situations, host communities that will be supporting them and the like. It means you know, almost an $11 billion price tag this year. And you've seen, of course, with if you put in humanitarian response plans, refugee response plans, the, the, the overall um, scenario in terms of need, as we've talked about and all, you, all of you know, it's not a, it's not a good trajectory. So we struggle a lot internally in terms of because we have we feel we are we we are morally <laughs> driven to respond. If we can add something, we need to respond. We have comparative advantages. We should offer them on the protection side is obviously clearly where that is. But it has meant an organization that is as complex and as large and uh, and complicated in terms of the delivery that we're now bringing it back to basics in some ways in terms of our broader transformation. Have we lost sight, and you've heard this from our High Commissioner, from Filippo Grande, when he's spoken, including to this conference in previous years, about the issues related to solutions. Have we become so focused on the protection, the life-saving, the immediate emergencies, which by the way, last year we responded to 35 of them. A normal year would be eight to 10. So I mean, it's in terms of that kind of pressure on the system, we're just one actor in that system. It is, it's, it's monumental, but it, does, it means we can't though step back from, from where we do need to be thinking about the long-term investments in communities. Self-reliance, for example, some of the protection elements that will give people the legal basis to be in a community even if they can't safely go home or be resettled or locally integrate. So there are, I mean, there. Are, it, 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 I don't answer your question. I think it's a very relevant one and I think all of us, individual agencies and the system as a whole are continuing to grapple with it. I do think that there would be a fair amount of criticism if we had something to offer in a response and we weren't there. 
Uh, it's, so I think there is a lot of pressure on us to, to ensure that we do that as efficiently as we've been talking about that and as effectively as possible. And I just wanted to thank you all for the opportunity to be here this morning. It's been a pleasure. I could not answer as eloquently as Kelly this last part. Let me um, rapidly answer the, uh, the question from the colleague from Colombia, which is EU specific. Um, look, we have to do what we can with what we have. Uh, our legal basis is from 1996. If we go tomorrow to council in parliament, uh, we would not get an equally good legal basis. So we examine the question, do we go to revise it when we were writing the communication uh, three years ago? I was part of the team writing the communication, and we decided against uh, revising the regulation for fear of getting something less good substance-wise, money-wise. So short of this uh, legal change, we are doing everything else we can, and we think this localization guidance is a good step to that. Uh, and on CBPFs, we will let Martin Griffiths answer that, but I'm sure if, if donors get provided more money to CBPFs, OCHA would be delighted. Um, and then the, the, the question, I think, yes, on the affected communities, they should be a smack clear at the center of what we do, and that uh, everybody agrees on that. Now, how exactly to do it? Uh, there is no miracle solution, silver bullet, but uh, I think some of the avenues we are pursuing through the grand bargain will also help on that front. Um, and I would just end on the, the, the question of um, on 2016 and high expectations. Frankly, we did not have such high expectations. I mean, I was in New York with Georgieva in 2016. We were not expecting much of this to happen overnight. Uh, and it is still good to see some things happening because of this. Now, many of them would probably have happened anyway because honestly they are common sense. Okay, as the needs grow and we want to be more efficient and we want to be closer to the affected population the first responders, it was only commonsensical to do some of this. But my guess is it would not have happened equally fast even if it clearly wasn't fast enough, but without this set of commitments. And I think uh, success back then was uh, defined as if everybody does their share, we'll make progress collectively. And I think success tomorrow will be defined very much in the same terms. Uh, over to Matt. Thank you. So all good questions, but I would like to give just a very little uh, thought about the internal pressures, about the desire to be big uh, and the need to be different. Yeah. So, um, well, in Oxfam, we have not increased the size over the last years because we went through a difficult moment, as is well known. Uh, but definitely this discussion is on the table. Um, do we need to be bigger in front of the needs? How do we uh, ensure our imperative and mandate in, the, in front of the needs, but our commitment to localization? And the solution that we find is to open the discussion about what does it mean to be an intermediary? And to be honest, even the word intermediary is a challenging one for a lot of colleagues in the organization because it means we intermediate. Yeah? So we are just unpacking what does it mean. Again, another thing that is related to the culture. Um, and, but definitely we are engaging with the organizations because we believe if we want to do more anticipatory action, if we want to be closer from people and give power to people, we need to be as local as, as possible and as international as, as needed. And just to close on the ambition, I think that we have a moral imperative to be ambitious in front of the situation we are, uh, yeah, we need to be ambitious. But however, I think that we need to play with the ambition, you know, I mean play, use this ambition in a positive way. Let's try to ensure that all of us, we do better internally and that we all together tackle the different, the difficult things that we are facing. The ambition should be about how we develop the incentives to be able to be a better system. And definitely our own responsibility is to be accountable, but the ambition is part of our passion. And we hear this morning, and I cannot agree more, that we cannot miss the passion anymore. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, the grand bargaining signatory that re they realized there is uh, there was an issues with their uh, uh, with the implementing their commitments, and now they are starting uh, to uh, just correct uh, what what they uh, what they have been seeing that the issues of delaying the, this. 
And uh, this makes me feel that the uh, future of the grand bargaining is uh, promising. And hopefully, uh, together uh, with the grand bargaining uh, signatory, international NGOs, local NGOs, we will work together uh, toward uh, achieving uh, uh, the, uh, the commitments or achieving uh, <coughs> localized or local lead uh, uh, humanitarian response or and development. Uh, at the end, I want to take this opportunity to thank ACFA, uh, to which make uh, our, give us the opportunity as a local NGOs to make our voice uh, heard uh, globally. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Colleagues, thank you very much for your comments as panelists, I think provoking some very interesting discuss discussion. Clearly the, the discussion continues and the work continues, right? The potential is there, so now we have to really make it happen. Uh, that's the work ahead of us. But thank you very much for your participation in the panel. Uh, the good questions, I think we can call it to a close here. We're well over time. Uh, so thank you very much. We'll have to be a little quick with lunch, uh, but we do have a little less than an hour. Uh, lunch is on site though, so that uh, hopefully is something that can be done, but we'll go ahead and break now. Thank you very much.